Hello, 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 and welcome back to yet another NFL Draft video. Today we're doing NFC North, Bears number one overall pick, Lions, Packers, and Vikings. A lot of interesting positions and talking points here. A lot of great drafts, matter of fact. So, by the way, I think the Packers have had 30 draft picks the last two seasons, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, it's a lot of shit we got to get into. So, not to waste any of y'all's time, thank you for watching, and let's get right into it. Starting off first, we're going to talk about the team that had the number one overall pick. That is the Bears. Let's just hop right into it, man. I thought, fuck, I forgot that. <laughs> fuck, I forgot to do that shit already. All right, whatever. So, number one overall pick, we got Caleb Williams. Um, everybody knew this was coming. Um, it was talked about for a long time. And when push came to shove, the Bears made the right choice. It's an A-plus, right? If, if you get your franchise quarterback, you grab the best quarterback in the whole draft, and you did what you're supposed to do. It has to be an A-plus, right? This is what I gave the Panthers last year for drafting Bryce Young. It's what I gave the Texans for drafting C.J. Stroud. There's nothing else you could have done, so I have to give it an A-plus. Um, they also drafted Romo Dunze at number nine. This was my A-plus for them. I think this was their best pick, to be honest, because nobody was really thinking about Rome. Well, the debate, right, was do you get an offensive lineman do you get a defensive lineman or do you get Odunze? The entire time, I wanted them to get Odunze because I thought if you draft your quarterback right, you want to give him the most amount of weapons as possible, right, to succeed early. You saw what the Texans did for C.J. Stroud, and I think Caleb is going to be able to come into a situation where you got Romo Odunze, D.J. Moore, Keenan Allen, uh, Cole Komet, DeAndre Swift, Roshan Johnson, and a good offensive line. You have so much talent there set up for him already where all the pressure's on his shoulders. You have, you know, a full pantry, as some would say. You know, what what kind of meal can he make with those ingredients? So I love the first two selections. Their offense should be explosive, and both these guys should honestly be a dynamic duo for years and years to come if everything pans out. So I gave both of those picks A pluses. I thought Odunze was their best pick of the draft. Next up, we got Kieran Omegadaji. Sorry, let me try it. Actually. Omega, Omega G, Omega G, <laughs> offensive tackle out of Yale. This is a guy who probably will not play offensive tackle immediately, right? Because the Bears do already have two bookends there, Darnell Wright and um, forget the name of the other guy. I think it's Braxton Jones. But they already have two tackles. So we look at Kieran. You're probably going to see a guy who starts off in the interior of the offensive line, which I have no problem with. Um only issue you have here is right if you're going to draft an offensive lineman which I think they should have done there were other guys available um good value though for Kieran he's a guy I saw go in the second round a lot so for him to fall to the third round is you know good value for the Bears it's just it's a great pick right I gave it an A minus I like the fact they're building through the offensive line and you're also getting a guy who's versatile most of these offensive linemen in these drafts right have played multiple positions so that's always so important to look at and I think he's a guy who could play day one as a guard and if he does that would make this pick even more valuable than an a minus um and he probably actually now that i think about it, it's also their steal of the draft you know to fall you know more than a dozen picks i'd say from where he was in the second round to the third round due to injury i believe um next up we got tory taylor punch out of iowa now <laughs> they had a lot of holes to fill on defense i'd say and they didn't do any of that they decided to go with the punter right the only reason this is not a D, D minus, F, D plus, anything like that, is because this guy is the face of Iowa football. <laughs> People are calling him a system punter because of how bad Iowa's offense was. But, man, look at the picture here. Look at that leg action. This guy's a professional, right? Um, but seriously, though, he's like the best punter ever, apparently. <laughs> Uh, I'm a I'm a fan of how bad Iowa football is, and but this guy, th let me tell you, this guy is something special, and I'm being serious there. So the only reason this is not a, just a horrible grade, right? Because they did have actual holes on defense they needed to fill, but this guy is the goat punter, possibly. So, so I gave it a C plus just because. Uh, but th this is probably the worst pick. And then number 144, they took Austin Booker, edge rush out of Kansas. This is a guy right here who has not actually seen the field much, right? He was more of a rotational guy, and he's a very, very raw prospect, but he has all of the physical tools, right, that if they develop him correctly, 
could eventually pan out right to be a dominant player. And I don't, I, that's what other people have said, not me. So I gave it a B, right? Because, you know, later round pick, you decide to take a shot in the guy. What I don't necessarily love with these last two picks, you didn't really take anybody for the defense that has really proven anything, right? You took a punter and a guy who was a role player in college, right? So you don't spend either of your last two picks on guys that, you know, are established, we know about, or we're fairly confident can contribute. So you, t- you kind of took risks there with both of your last two picks. However, look at the distribution there. Two-way plus is an A minus, a B and a C plus. Only five picks, but because of the quality of their first three picks, it still comes out to a 6.5, which is an A minus. That's why I decided to give them, right? Only five picks. One's a special teamer, right? So, you know, it's it's tough to, to say. You only have four position guys taken. So a very small draft, but it's going to be hard to find teams, right, that got two. So the thing about this, they only had five picks in the whole draft. But according to a lot of people, they probably got two of the top six, seven players in the entire class. That's ridiculously impressive. So I gave them an A- minus overall. It's a great draft right there, probably below the Eagles in terms of all the teams we've talked about so far. Next up, though, we got the Lions, who were very impressive in their own right. So they traded up, right? They had a later pick than the, than 24. They traded up with the Cowboys, I believe, because they saw the Eagles take Quinion Mitchell, and they were afraid that their guy, Terry and Arnold, would be gone by the time they got to their pick. So they traded up to select Terry and Arnold. I love this pick, right? You know, do I think he's better than Nate Wiggins? Do I think he's better than Cooper DeGene? Do I think he's better than, you know, some of these other guys? I'm not sure. But the point is that the Lions think he was the best guy available. So I'm going to trust their opinion, right? Um, We saw what they did last year with Brian Branch. You get him his teammate, Terry and Arnold and Brian Branch, reunited now in Detroit. You could put Brian Branch at nickel, Terry on the outside. I really like that a lot. So I gave it an A plus because they took, in their opinion, the best DB on the board, which it was also, let's keep in mind, their biggest need by a mile was cornerback. So I can't fault that in any way. It's an amazing pick by the Lions, and the fans should be ecstatic with that move. And then at 61, Ennis Rakestraw just falls in your lap. This was the guy that a lot of people had them mocked to at 28, whatever it was, 29. This was the guy. So to be able to trade up and get arguably a guy that nobody thought you'd be able to get in Terry and Arnold, right? And then to sit back at the end of the second round and get the guy people thought you were going to get in the first round, it's an A+. How can I give it anything less than an A+. If they would have stayed at 28-29 and took Rakestraw, well, it's different because, right, all the corners were off the board. But you get what I'm saying. If the draft would have played out as we thought it did and they would have took Rakestraw in the late 20s, I would have given that like an A. So to get him at 61 is an insane value. I don't know why he dropped. He's a little undersized, but I honestly don't know the reason he fell so far. I think it's just because all the corners fell so far. So he was just a victim of that drop. But man, this is a guy who at the latest should have been gone in the early 40s. And you get him at 61. It's amazing value for a guy. The only thing about this, it's an A+, plus, so there really are no flaws. But because they've made so many additions this offseason, they got Terry and Arnold, Ennis Rakestraw, Amik Robertson, and Carlton Davis, and they already had Brian Branch playing very well in the nickel. I don't really think Rakestraw is going to see a lot of action his rookie year, but for a developmental pick, they just turned in one offseason their biggest weakness into one of their biggest strengths. That is incredibly impressive to, to just do that in like with such speed, right? And such talented guys, too. Carlton Davis, Terry and Arnold, Rakestraw, Amik Robertson, like that's a, that's those are great additions at cornerback next up we got Giovanni Manu (laughs) offensive tackle out of British Columbia you you read that right so here's the rundown on him he has ridiculous size I think he's 6'8 350 so that's the reason that a guy from British Columbia got drafted so high but I like it man you're taking a shot right because let's be honest here after you take corner what's the Lions real need Edge rusher, maybe. Yeah, I could have. But, you know, I'd rather take a shot in the guy, right, who has the size to be something special, right? Like, look at look at Dewan Jones, right, for the Browns. He had special size. This guy has special size. I'd rather take a shot on a guy like that because we know the Lions are built offensively through their offensive line. So if if this guy pans out, 
it's it's a you know it's an a plus pick but obviously you're taking a developmental guy that is not you know not by any means a finished product so i gave it a b plus because i like the idea i see the vision right i'm giving him a little bit of leeway here because when your first two picks are this good right the rest of your draft you get the benefit of the doubt because you've shown me how competent you are with your first two picks so i give this a b plus second round of picks we got sion vaki out of utah this was actually their worst pick in my opinion i forgot to put that here but i do think that vaki here I really didn't think safety is the big of a need, right? You got so many DBs now. You can put Brian Branch back there. I don't, but also here's the thing. If this, if Sion Vaki was just a safety, this is probably a C plus or a B minus pick, but Sion Vaki also is able to give you something at running back. This guy was the Travis Hunter, the best two-way player in the country last season, arguably with Travis Hunter, because he gave you over 500 all-purpose yards at the running back position. He ran very hard at Utah. So He's a dual threat. He's also a special teams guy. I'm sure Dan Campbell will love him. So I think it's still a good pick, right? But we're talking about, you know, they probably did need some actual help at edge rusher. And you're taking a guy after you already took two DBs. It's, you know, it's a little questionable, but I like the player. I don't hate the value for the player. It's just when you look at team need, I wouldn't have thought safety slash running back after already drafting two DBs would have been, you know, in the cards for the Lions. Um, 189 Makai Wingo, an extremely fast but undersized, right? Six foot tall, a little undersized defensive tackle, extreme speed, though. He is a guy where I'm thinking, right, he's going to be converted to a defensive end in the NFL, you know, to use that speed. Or maybe, you know, you know, he could stay at defensive tackle, but I like the pick more because it's addressing the defensive line. They already got, uh, was a DJ Reader from the Bengals. They got the Bengals defensive tackle to come play to D-tackle in Detroit. So they already made some additions there this offseason, but I still like the the shot on a guy that shows special traits in terms of his speed at the defensive tackle position. So I gave this an A-, minus, right, because position of need with arguably the best player available. But then you got Christian Mahogany, right, because I did think at some point they had to go interior offensive line and at 210, you got a guy where other teams were wanting this guy. Like other friends are like, Mahogany's on the board. We need an interior offensive line. Why didn't we take him? The Lions got that guy at 210. Ridiculous value. I had to give this an A. Usually these later picks, I don't really, I'm I don't I can't I try I try to keep these later picks in the middle because it's hard to say, you know, a pick in the 200s was an A or an F or anything like that. You know what I mean? But Christian Mahogany, I have to give it an A because position of need, and you draft a guy who's gonna be able to sit back, learn for a year. It, a, a massive steal for the Lions. I gave it an eight. So when you look at it overall, two offensive linemen, a defensive lineman, three defensive backs. I love that, the, you know, the distribution there. So it's a 6.83, which I believe is actually higher than what the Eagles were. Or maybe it was pretty close. Maybe it was pretty close. I don't actually remember off the top of my head. I know I gave the Eagles an A+. Plus. I'm going to give the Lions an A because I really did like what they – what they did with their draft. And I thought they walked away with some amazing picks. So Lions right up there as either the best or second best draft we've seen in, in general so far. Next, we've got the Packers with their 70 picks. Starting it off here, Jordan Morgan at 25. Um, Listen, I definitely thought the Packers were going to address offensive line with their first two or three picks. Did I think it was going to be the first round? No. Did I think it was going to be first round when all these other guys were off the board? Certainly no. Um, was Grant Barton available? Didn't he go to the Bucks at 26? If he did and you took Morgan over him, I'm not sure. I Yeah, there's just a lot of other directions I would have gone. I'm not sure if Grant Barton was available now that I think about it. I'm pretty sure he was, though, because the line's at 24. I think he was available. So you got Grant Barton you passed up on. Cooper DeGene you passed up on. Kool-Aid you passed up on. I'm not sure I love, you know, look, Jordan Morgan at 25, it's not bad value. But even guys like Tyler Guyton, you know, what do you what do you want here with Morgan? Do you want a future tackle? I think that's what they're they're aiming at here. And you might be, you know, you might be able to get that. I'm not, I'm I'm not saying that they're not gonna accomplish their goal here. That's why I gave them a B plus. If you're looking for a tackle, Jordan Morgan at 25, I'm not gonna criticize that. But you look at what they lost. In their secondary, Darno Savage replacing with McKinney. Um, you lost Rasul Douglas in, in a trade. You haven't replaced him yet. Eric Stokes, we don't know about. 
Cooper DeGene was right there. Kool-Aid was right there. That's the direction I would have gone. Oh, Nate Wiggins was right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. You got three corners. You got Graham Barton. You got Tyler Guyton. And you go with Jordan Morgan. It's a lot of – there's a lot of options you could have went with there. I'm not going to criticize it yet because I, I think this was a solid option. But when you look at all the other guys, I don't know. I don't. That's all I'm going to say about that. Edron Cooper at 45. I love this. Quay Walker was there last season, last two seasons, I believe. He's been very good so far. You lose – De- Devondre Campbell to free agency. You replace him with Edron Cooper. Edron Cooper, probably my favorite linebacker, honestly, in the entire draft. Um, what he does within like five to six yards, a line of scrimmage is special. He is a dominant player in the run game. He is able to get after the quarterback at that middle linebacker position, which is dangerous. If you have a guy that can actually put up five plus sacks a year, it's just so valuable. It opens up so many more options. So I gave this an A. I thought this was, this was their best pick. Um, only reason not an A plus is because I still think they could address some things in the secondary. I believe, you know, guys like Tyler Newbin, Rakestra obviously were available. So there, you could have went other directions. But if you're going to go linebacker, it was an amazing pick. I still think overall it was an amazing pick. It was their best pick out of their 30. But yeah, Edron Cooper at 45. I love that pick. Javon Bullard at 58. They finally went the secondary. I had mocked Bullard to the Packers before. So, you know, not mad at this at all. The only reason I love this pick, only reason it's not an A plus because Rake Straw was right there. I definitely thought the Packers were going to address cornerback, but they just they didn't do that, which I'm not mad at it. It's still an A. An A is an amazing pick. It's a great pick. But when there's if there's room for doubt, I can't give it an A plus, right? An A plus means I couldn't think of anything else to do. And with these last two picks, I could have thought of some more options. Marshawn Lloyd, 88. Uh, this is a pick where we're really not going to see the dividends next season, right? Because you got Josh Jacobs and you got A.J. Dillon. This almost certainly means, right, that A.J. Dillon is not back after next season. So Marshawn Lloyd is going to take a year, not play much of a role, but then 2025 and onward, he's going to be a, a big player for them. So that's what I'm, I'm seeing here. That's the vision, the, the assumption I'm operating under. However... When you spend the number 88 overall pick on a guy that's not going to contribute next season, you know, it raises some eyebrows, you know, but I understand you already had three picks in the first two rounds that addressed positions of need. I'm not mad at them taking a developmental player, right? Next up though, Tyron Hopper out of Missouri. And listen, they've already addressed damn near everything they could besides corner, right? So a lot of these are going to be double dipping at times. Tyron Hopper, you're double dipping at linebacker. I really don't love it though, because it's still it's guys like TJ Tampa are on the board and Tyron Hopper. You already got Edron Cooper. But this is the thing. You already got Edron Cooper. You already had Quay Walker. It's not like they're a team where they just had no linebackers. If everything goes according to plan, Tyron Hopper is probably not seeing the field. You know, it's a number three linebacker. So I don't like taking another linebacker so soon after Edron Cooper when you already got other young linebackers. It's just I don't I don't love the selection there when you still needed a corner. So I gave that a C minus. I thought that was their worst pick overall. 111, Evan Williams. I don't mind taking two safeties, especially considering we're probably going to see Javon Bullard play in the nickel a lot. So you put Bullard in the nickel, you still need a safety to play in the back end. So Evan Williams there makes sense, right? I gave it a B. Because if you're going to take two safeties, play one in the nickel, one in the back, you're still able to, you know, keep both of those guys on the field, right? So 111, Evan Williams, I thought it was a good pick, good value. Um, I think he'll make the roster and everything. 163, you take Jacob Monk, uh, center out of Duke. This is a guy who had a lot of versatility, played in a lot of, you know, positions at Duke. And I think interior offensive line, because you already took Jordan Morgan, take a guy in the interior as well, protecting Jordan Love has to be high up there on their list because think about it, right? You can't take a quarterback, can't take a running back. You have so many receivers, can't take a tight end. The only way to improve this offense, right, is through the offensive line. So I do respect the the effort to continue to build through the trenches there. I gave that a B plus because, you know, it's nothing special about that pick. It's just a good pick, a good decision that I agree with. Keaton Oladapo, listen, taking the safety, good. Taking two safeties, I understand it. Taking three safeties, in your first eight picks, or nine picks, sorry, I'm sorry, I can't get behind that. Triple dip, triple dipping at safety, and maybe you're just hedging your bets. Maybe you say, we like Evan Williams, but if Evan Williams doesn't work out, we got Keaton Oladapo, I'm sorry. 
triple dipping at safety, I'm just, I'm not a fan. I gave that a C plus, okay, because it could still work out. I could still be wrong, but triple dipping at safety is kind of crazy. Next, we got Travis Glover, offensive tackle, Georgia State. Again, listen, you're not going to see me fall. The only way they can improve this offense is through the offensive line, okay, and through these young players developing and getting better. So take as many offensive linemen as you want, as far as I'm concerned. I wish they would have picked more offensive linemen. I wish Oladapo and Tyron Hopper both would have been either corners or offensive line. So, you know, I'm not going to fault this pick at 202. Um, next, we got Michael Pratt, quarterback out of Tulane, honestly – I think he's a preseason guy. I think he's a body for training camp. I'd be pretty shocked if he actually makes the roster. Obviously, if he does make the roster, he's, you know, QB3. Or maybe maybe he could compete with Sam Clifford. Who knows? Or Sean Clifford. But I don't, you know, it's it's a whatever pick in the seventh round. Kalen King, though, let me tell you something. For the only corner you take in the entire draft to be a former All-American, with like three to three picks until the end of the draft, right? This is the very, very end of the draft. They took a former All American a, a position of need. How can I not give this an A? Now, I'll give you a couple of things. Kalen King, probably a little undersized, right? If we're talking about traditional boundary corner, did not have a great year last season. Once Joey Porter left, Kalen King got exposed a little bit. But man, give me a former All American in the seventh round any day of the week. I don't care how bad he was last. He wasn't awful. I don't care how bad he was. I don't care how how much he got cooked at the senior bowl. Kalen King in the seventh round is an A. And for that to be a position of need, it's gotta be an it's just gotta be an A. The only thing I can I'm concerned about is that, you know, obviously for him to fall all the way to the seventh round, you know, it must have been a really, really bad season last year for Kalen King. Because this is a guy that was talked about, was mocked in the first round consistently. And it just kept going all the way down to damn near him being undrafted. So that's a crazy fall off. One of the biggest fall offs for anybody. But hey, still, still at 255 for Kalen King. I love the pick. Here's the distribution. How many was it in total? Six, nine, only 11 guys, actually. It was only 11? Okay, it was only 11. Let me quit hating on the Packers. But all the guys there, and this is the thing, right? They got a 5.8 overall. I decided to round up, but here's the thing, right? So the Bears only took five guys, right? The Packers took 11. And the problem with my whole system is that it doesn't really account for volume, right? So the Bears got a higher grade, but they took way less players. The Packers are probably going to have more players from this draft that make the roster and contribute and all that. But it's, it's tough because when you have more players, you have more Bs, more Cs, stuff like that, that dilute the grade overall. So... Next season, I got to figure out a way to credit teams for the amount of you know picks they have overall, because it's it's valuable, right? If it team if one team if one team drafts eleven, the other team drafts five. Just theoretically, right? The team that drafts eleven has a, a larger haul, more talent coming in. Next, last up, we got the Vikings, and let's get right into it, man. Uh, JJ McCarthy. I'll be honest. I've said it the whole way through. I don't think McCarthy is a guy that should have gone in the first round. I don't think McCarthy is a guy that should have gone in the top 40. However, he did. There are a couple of things saving this pick from being an F. The Vikings did not trade up. Can you imagine if they would have traded up and lost out on Dallas Turner to get McCarthy? God, would that have been an all-time awful move? The Vikings didn't trade up to take him at number five. So that's one little positive thing. It shouldn't even be a question, right? I, it's like, because you didn't run into the road and get hit by a car, I got to credit you. No, I, you, you're supposed to not do stupid things. So I, it's tough to actually credit them for that, but at least they didn't make the worst possible move. Um, and also their options were limited, right? If they would have had Michael Penix on the board, Bo Nix on the board still, then this probably would have been an F. But Penix was gone already. It was between McCarthy and Nix. It was pretty simple in my opinion. If you're going to take a quarterback, you wait until 23. They decided to spend their number 10 overall pick, but this is the thing that saves their draft a little bit. The guy that they got at number 17, because they traded up, is the guy I probably would have took at number 10 and then and then waited. You know what I mean? So they still walked away with two guys, which I still would have, you know, credited them with taking originally. So I can simplify that. I would have expected them to take Dallas Turner at 10, McCarthy at 23. They still walked away with Dallas Turner and McCarthy. So I'm not as mad at that. 
So instead of an F, I gave it a D. Can't be any higher than a D because Bo Nix is on the board. He's the better player. I think he would have fit better in their system. All of that. So I think McCarthy is a bad player. But good thing for McCarthy is he's going to the best situation outside of the Bears of any quarterback now. So let's see what he can do. Dallas Turner at 17, he failed massively. He went from 8 to 17, lost out on millions of dollars. Um, he wasn't even the first defensive player drafted because that was Leatu Latu, two picks before him, and then Byron Murphy. But, you know, Dallas Turner at 17 is of incredible value. I love the fact that the Vikings moved up in order to get him because that's a great player to walk away with, you know. And then you got Kyrie Jackson at 108. I gave this their steal of the draft because this is a guy that I saw in the second round, late second round, obviously, but to, I would have never thought he made it out of the third round. This is a guy that has size, six foot four playing cornerback, right? And cornerback being such a position of need for the Vikings. It feels like they were always in need of cornerback, you know. So to get Kyrie Jackson at 108, it's an absolute steal. I gave that an A. Um, so you got two great picks here and JJ McCarthy. And then over here, right, you got Walter Rouse, offensive tackle, out of Oklahoma. Um, what was the other pick here that everybody was playing? I think it was interior offensive line because I don't think he has the size to to kick in to the interior, especially when there were other guys on the board, right, that I think the Vikings could have drafted, like uh, Mahogany, for example, to play the interior. Walter Rouse is kind of a, a developmental pick because they already have both of their tackles bookended, so I don't think he's going to play it at all right away. And I don't think he has the size to kick inside. So I just – I don't really understand that pick when you had a need for interior and there were interior players on the board. You take a tackle to develop. I, I don't love that pick. I gave that a B-. minus. Then you got Will Riker at 203. I actually gave this a B plus, right, because I think, you know, the Vikings kicking position is kind of cursed, right? So to take Will Riker, who was a great kicker at Alabama, I just – you know, I just like the idea, honestly. I think the Vikings, imagine a world where the Vikings had a good kicker, right? It, everything would be different. So I gave that a B plus because if the Vikings can break their curse of awful kicking, that would truly be something to behold. And these last two picks, honestly, I don't think they're going to make the roster. So I decided not to grade them. So overall, you can see the distribution here. I decided to give them a five points. So I didn't decide. The formula was a 5.7. I didn't round up. I kept it at a B. They had some amazing picks, right? They had two really, really great picks with Kyrie Jackson, Dallas Turner. They should both be big players on that defense, right? But McCarthy, I'm going to die on this hill, was an awful pick. And their their last four picks, honestly, I don't think – outside of Will Riker, I don't think they're got, you know they're going to contribute much at all. So it's tough. It's tough to grade the Vikings draft because they're – complete opposite ends of the spectrum right at one point you had amazing pick awful pick not a lot of talent down the board so it's tough to grade but i gave him a 5.7 here's the distribution honestly i think the nfc north drafted well overall each of these teams right the packers with their second round the vikings with dallas turner and Kyrie jackson the bears with rome and caleb the lions with their first two picks and also down the board all of these teams had great moments in the draft that they should be proud of and they can walk away saying, damn, we nailed it here and here. So, honestly, each of these teams has something to be proud of. And I think this might go down as the best drafting division when we're all said and done here. But, man, that's going to be it for this video. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Um, who do you think had the best draft in the NFC North? Let me know. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> NFC West coming up, man. So, thank you for watching. And uh, have a great day.